Okay, take your Bible with me this morning and turn back to Ephesians chapter 6, hopefully one last time. Now, I don't have a clue uh, where I'm going when I get done with Ephesians. I'm, I was lying in bed last night thinking about uh, what I wanted to do next, and two, two uh, books came to mind. I've taught on both of them previously, but it's been years ago. It's been almost a decade over a decade on one of them, and uh, almost 10 full, 12 years on the other. I, I thought about either going back through and uh, doing Song of Solomon verse by verse, or else doing, do you remember when I did Jonah on Wednesday night? Do you know? I, I, I mean, I don't remember. I, I know I did it. Uh, we used to actually have a Wednesday night service, and I, I did uh, the book of Jonah, and I went through it. So I'm thinking one of those two. I, I actually don't hold me to that. Uh, but that's my plan. I pray the Lord to give me some direction, wisdom, and instruction on uh, where he would have me to go. We want to finish this thing up this morning uh, as we consider the believer's warfare one last time. Uh, and we'll just tag on to the end of it, the conclusion. And there's not a whole lot to be said about beginning in verse 20 through verse 24 because it's just basically Paul's closing argument, which we will touch on it. But we want to really kind of zero in this morning because we've been trying to get here for two previous lessons, and we're here today to talk about uh, this, the weapons of our warfare. We hear so much in our day about the weapons of our warfare, but most people are absolutely clueless when it comes to the weapons of our warfare. Uh, most men and women, religious men and women, people that are moral, sincere, dedicated, committed, go to church all the time, love their husband or their wife or their children or their parents, doing uh, upstanding men and women in the community, good grandmothers, good grandfathers, good aunts and uncles, all those things that men hold in such high esteem, they seem to think that this spiritual warfare has to do with the things of time and sense. It has to do with the struggles against uh, the immorality that is so prevalent in our country today, and it is. But I tell you what, you tell me, in comparison to other civilizations that have existed throughout time, tell me how we're more immoral or more ungodly than any others before us. Or they seem to think it has to do with maybe abortion or it has to do with pornography or it has to do with alcoholism or drug addiction or all these things that are, and listen, don't get me wrong, in reality all these things are sinful and evil and vile. All of them lead to destruction. All of them for the unbeliever end in death, do they not? The wages of sin, death. But the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if that's not the warfare, it's, if it's not me stopping drinking, stopping smoking, stopping cussing, stopping doing what men and women define as, as the warfare that we're involved in. You know, they, they all, you hear people make, religious people make this comment when they do something that they think is evil and wrong and vile. Who are they blaming on? The devil made me do it. Well, why did the devil make you do it? Well, I didn't use the weapons of the warfare. Well, number one, like I told you last week, if you're not a justified saint, if you do not at this moment rest in Christ Jesus, the Lord, your righteousness, you're not even in the warfare. You're a captive of Satan, right? You are, if, I don't care how, how, how good you might look to us, right now, if Christ Jesus is not the Lord your righteousness, what are you? You're an idolater. You're an, you, right now, you are an enemy in your mind by wicked works, and that's not being a bad person. Wicked works are what? Resting in, relying upon, trusting in anything other than what? Christ, his blood, his righteousness alone. And see, as we consider the believer's warfare, we have to always keep this in mind. This popped into my mind this morning as I was sitting there going over my notes one last time. Our Lord Jesus Christ said this, I am the vine. Right? In other words, he's the source. You are. Not the world, but you who? Believers. Justified saints. You, the branches. Not trying to be branches or trying to hold on as branches. I, there's a lot of religious people trying to hold themselves at the place of a branch. 
He says, I'm the vine. Every one of my children, they're not just kind of danglers holding on for dear life. I used to, I used to use those kind of, say, you know, I'm, there's going to be some believers going to just get in by the skin of their teeth. There ain't no believers getting in that way, Kenny. There's an abundance entrance to all God's elect. Listen, every one of God's children, now I, I believe this with all my heart, every one of God's children going to enter heaven just like Stephen did. Because Stephen went to heaven not because of what he did that day when they stoned him to death. What did he go to heaven for? The one he told them about based on his blood, his right. So he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Not trying to become, you are. He that abides continues in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Now listen to this. For without me... You can do nothing. Doesn't that agree perfectly with what Paul said in Romans chapter 7? For I find that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me. And that's what our Lord says. Without me you can do nothing. The will's present with me. But how to perform that which I desire, what I do not find. Don't find the power to do it. It amazes me how many times through the believer's life, myself included, we have tried to conquer, conquer some particular sin, yet to find ourselves ultimately to fail and to repeat the same thing, the sin that we're trying to conquer. Why is that? Without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> we're made, listen, we are made more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. Not through our own strength. Paul said, said this. He told those at Corinth. Listen to this. And th this, is, this is the problem that we get ourselves into as justified saints. He says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed. Because if you think you stand by your power, by your ability, take heed what's going to happen. How many times have you disappointed yourself as a as a Child of God, failed again, sinned against your God, sinned grievously in thought, word, action, or activity. So here's the thing. I said this last week. I'll say it again as we move into these, these particular aspects of the armor. If we ever stand against the world, if we ever take a true stand against the flesh, if we ever stand and are able to, to overcome the devil... It will not be by our own skill or our own might or even our own faith. It will be by prayerful, thoughtful, spirit-led obedience to what Paul wrote to these at Ephesus about. What did he say? This is how he starts off this, these, these uh, weapons of our warfare. Finally, my brethren, be strong where? In the Lord and in the power of his might. Is those that are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now look at the, these weapons that he's given us. Look at verse uh, 14. <clears throat> stand therefore. He says when you've done everything, verse 13 he says, when you've done everything you can do, do what? Keep standing where? Standing on Christ. <laughs> Unmoved. I, I, a verse that always comes in my mind is this. The just, the righteous, live how? By faith. When he made that statement, he said, also, we are not of those that draw back to perdition, but of those that believe to the saving of the soul. In other words, the child of God... You can't make him stop believing. <laughs> you can't move him off of his hope. No matter how bad things might appear outwardly. So he says, stand therefore having your loins girt about. Girt about with what? With truth. The law came by, was given by Moses, right? John 1. 
The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Our Lord, before Pontius Pilate, said, I came to bear witness of what? The truth. He that's of the truth, what do they do? They hear my voice. Now they do. This, this is the first part of the armor mentioned. Because think about it. This, this idea of the truth being girt about our loins, it's the foundation of the entirety of this armor that we've been called to put on. That word translated having, he says standing there, stand there for having. And I've always, often wondered about that. You see words and you look at them in Strong's and it'll have a word and usually it'll have a number behind the word that tells you the Greek word or Hebrew word for it, and then behind that, it, in these little uh, greater than, minus than signs, it'll put another number, and it tells you whether it's a verb or adjective or a noun. Well, I kept running into words that had a parenthesis with a zero in it, and I thought, what the, I kept looking for a zero. What's a zero mean? Well, I, I did some digging and kept looking, and, and I got to looking at this verse, and I noticed that that word having, therefore, that word having, and the word gird about, it's the same word. And it's got a zero in between it. You know what it does? It means that in the way this is literally written, this word having and this word gird about, it's the same word. And it means this. It means the girdle, the truth, as a girdle. Or it means this more better. I think this is the best translation of these three words together. To equip oneself with the knowledge of the truth. In other words, be wise in the Lord and in the power of his mouth. It has to do with the gospel. And it has to do with the doctrines of Christ. How, how did he start this thing? In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of what? Truth. But he doesn't stop there. What, what's the next phrase that's out of his mouth? In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. So the truth concerns what? The gospel of our salvation. See, here's the thing I'm trying to get to this morning. A person has to hear and know the truth before they can be established in the truth. Does that make sense? They got to hear and know the truth. And listen, I, I, no man can know me except the Father which has sent me, reveal him. So you got to know, you got to know him. We preached on that thing, was it last week? Knowing God? They shall all know me from the greatest to the least. See, faith, first of all, it has to become objective before it can become subjective. Is that, does, do you understand what I mean by that? I had to look those meaning. I'd say I didn't pay close enough attention. I, now I do know what objective and, you know, it, in other words, what's the objective side of faith? It's what God records for us. It's the facts. The subjective side is what? It's what we enter into and rest in. It's when we know it's mine. That's, that's to be, it's a subject of my hope then. See, it's one thing to know of it and be able to even say some things about it. I, I've got a lot of people that I know of throughout time that can say a lot of things that's true and scriptural. But then turn around and in the next breath, you know what they'll do? They'll deny everything they said is truth by what they imply. You can't talk about free and sovereign grace and then turn around and talking about turning and burning. Either salvation is conditioned on Christ alone or it's conditioned on the sinner. And I'm telling you, if it's conditioned on us, we're doomed. If, it, if one shred of my salvation rests on me, my faith, my repentance, my hope, desire to do better, my desire to love God, if any of it's based on that... You're looking at a man that's going to hell. And not only are you looking at a man that's going to hell, I'm looking at a crowd of folks that are going right along with me. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. Listen, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's the objective side of it. What's he not ashamed of? The gospel of Christ. 
for it is the power of God unto salvation. In other words, whatever this gospel is, it's how God saves his people, period. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith. That's from objective faith, written down, proclaimed, preached out by God's servants, his children, to God's elect and everything. To faith. What? To faith given to the sinner who in turn rests in that faith. This proves it that doctrine, and I know my generation seems to think this is the most foolish statement anybody can make, doctrine is a major issue in the Christian life and in the Christian warfare. How do we know that? Listen to, listen to John. In 2 John, he says this, Whosoever transgresseth and bideth not in the doctrine of Christ, Hath not God. I'd say that's pretty clear. But we got to define some term. What's the doctrine of Christ? See, that's, that's where people go crazy. You can't make this thing so specific. Our Lord was very specific, was he not? The apostles were very specific. Didn't he just, I just read, quote and read a verse to you there from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14? In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. It's a particular message. <clears throat> he that abides, continues in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. This is how important this thing of doctrine is. If any... Come, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, which one? The doctrine of Christ. Receive him not into your house. In other words, then house is not talking about individual homes. What's he talking about? Don't receive him into the house of God. Don't count him your brother. A lot of folks out there that consider themselves reformed, that they turn around and everybody's their brother and sister in Christ. Is that true? We all, we all, universal fatherhood of God and brotherhood of mankind? Is that, is that applicable to us? Neither bid him God speak. In other words, don't tell him you're okay. The Lord bless you in what you do. If they're preaching not this gospel, what? They don't have God. How can you bless them? Thank God's blessings on you. For he that bids him God speed, you, you bid these, these devils is what they are. You bid them God speed, listen to this, you're a partaker of his evil deeds. It's our response, every one of us, not just your pastor. It's the responsibility of every single solitary child of God from the newest born babe in Christ to the most mature child of God that's walked with him 30, 40, 50, 60 years to be skillful, hear that? To be skillful in the word of righteousness. Why is that so important? The only way you can stand firm, firm in face of the enemy is how? Standing firm in the truth. Here's the next part, piece of armor. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. What did the breastplate do? If you, if you think of somebody in armor, what does a breastplate protect? Now we know we're going to get to a helmet. I, I'd say that the, the head and the vital organs are all equally important. But when we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, what does it protect? It protects your heart, your lung, your liver. You know, those things that are vital to your physical life. And this breastplate of righteousness, what are we talking about? We're talking about Christ is the Lord our righteousness, right? And it protects the very life of a believer because it's their only hope and cause of salvation. His righteousness imputed. That righteousness he worked out by his perfect law-keeping to God's holy law as well as his vicarious death, substitutionary death, as the surety and substitute of God's people, is imputed to his people, charged to his people, and rested in and believed in by true God-given faith. And folk, what we're talking about here is it's our right standing with God. That's what repels accusations or charges from Satan or from the world. 
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Think about that. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that declares righteous. It's God that justifies. Who's he that can condemn? Who's the only one that can condemn you? Christ that died, yea, rather that's risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So the only one that can, could condemn me would never condemn me, because what did he do? He died as my substitute. He, listen, our Lord Jesus Christ, think about it, he literally bore our sins in his body on the tree, and by his stripes, what are we? We're put in a healable position, not on your life. We're healed. <laughs> we are right now the righteousness of God. It's not something waiting, to, waiting out there. Now, we'll see it in its fullness, but we're that now. Do you understand that? God views us right now holy and accepted in blood. We're saved and we're eternally secure based on Christ's righteousness alone. That's what this breastplate is, having on the breastplate of righteousness. I, I think one of my favorite verses, I, I, I quote it to myself all the time, and I just keep thinking about it and thinking about the words, and I, I've looked it up in every different kind of translation that I can look up. I've looked at the individual words, but it means so much. It's so rich. It's so full. It's so comforting. It's so encouraging to me as a child of God, and it should be to all God's children. It's Acts 13, 38, and 39. You ought to memorize those terms. Two verses. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that by this man is preached unto you. I wrote an article this week. It put it on Facebook and put it in the bulletin. What's preached to you? What's preached to you every time somebody stands up here? What will be preached when Kenny stands up here in July? What, what's preached or taught or spoken out when we have other men read and lead us in prayer? What's preached out? Forgiveness of sins. And by him, by this person, through whom this forgiveness was to come, by him all the believing are declared righteous, are justified from all things. How many things? From all things. From which they could not. You hear that? They could not be declared righteous by the law of Moses. I tell you what, our, our state, I mean, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the dude that's running our state now, but I always keep in mind the powers that be, where'd they come from? I, and I'll say this to you, because we're headed toward another election cycle. And I'm telling you from, from the scriptures, not from my thoughts, from the scriptures, who's going to be your next president? Who's going to be, be elected? I'll tell you who's going to be elected. Exactly who God has purposed to be elected. Do you believe that? I, if you don't, you don't believe what the book tells you. The powers that be, where do they come from? How did Pharaoh rise to power? How did Caesar ever achieve greatness? You think these guys pulled them stuff up? I tell you what, the richest man in the world is who? Elon Musk. I guarantee you from what I've read about that man, he don't believe anything except the dollar and success. But where, that, where did every dollar that he's got that made him the richest man on the planet, where did it come from? He says he makes his reign to fall on the just, the righteous, and the unright. And see, that's the thing that puzzles us. We're like, well, why can't we have more? You got exactly what you're supposed to have. <laughs> you hear me? Because if, 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 if it was in your best interest and for his glory for you to have more, you know what you'd have? You'd have more. Because I guarantee you, most of us, without exception, you give us more, it ain't going to bring us closer to him. What does it do? We go the other direction. That's just, that's just humanity. That's human nature. That's the way we are. 
Christ made us right. Look at the next, next part of the armor. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I'd have you to notice here that he didn't say to have you, doesn't say to have your feet shod with the gospel of peace. But he says that you'd have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You say, well, that's no, no different. Yeah, it is. He's already discussed. What if we are, as a child of God, we already know the gospel of peace. See? So he's not saying you, you do this so you'll get peace. He's saying you be prepared. Be re- this, to me, this is going back to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3. Sanctify the Lord God, 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh thee. Here's the preparation of the gospel of peace. The reason of the hope that lieth in you. I got I, well, Look, we have the hope of God. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Be ready, be prepared. Make it your diligent duty to be able to articulate the gospel. I'm going to tell you what, a lot of us, myself included, we are shirking our duties as children of God. It's our responsibility to take this book. You, you should be diligent students of this book, every one of us. And how many of us, if we're honest, and I'd never ask anybody to, to hold up a hand and say, but how many of us this week, seriously, ask yourself this question, have I is one whom Christ gave all for? to attain my salvation. How much time have I dedicated this week to looking at what I've been given in Christ? How much time? A minute? Five minutes? Ten minutes? I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. God help my mind be stayed on you all the time. Now that doesn't mean ignore, ignore your wife or your children or don't do your job. I hadn't said that. But I tell you what, if you work from 7 to 5, most of us, unless you're older like us, you know, I go to bed now. I'm, I'm headed toward bed at 9 o'clock. They don't get, but that's still four hours. Couldn't I pick up the book or pick up a good good commentary on God's Word? Or if, if you don't want to, I just don't like reading that much. Well, most of them, you can listen to them. <laughs> listen to things that that... that Fertilize your mind with the promises and the blessings that you've been given in Christ Jesus your Lord. That word translated your feet means to place one's foot on the vanquished. What does that mean? Our enemies vanquished. Now by God-given faith, what do we do? We put our foot, foot on. The word shod means to underbind or to bind under oneself. What are we to, we're to bind ourselves up in the peace of God. We are, we are children of God. Here's the next one. Above all, taking a shield of faith wherewith you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The sense of this verse is the same as what Paul told those Hebrew believers that the just shall live by faith. We live <clears throat> and we defend ourselves against Satan's attack. You know how we do it? it this is, it's, it's all about the truth. Well, God's testimony. L- write this verse down, but let me read it to you. In, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 and 11, it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. It was said unto them that they should rest yet 
for a little season until their fellow servants, their fellow servants, also in their brethren that should be killed as they were killed should be fulfilled. But we listen, we, we don't we don't walk I, I tell you what, I think that's the wrong that's the wrong verse. It's, it's, I got I got wrote I just I just realized it. It's Revelation four verse ten and eleven. The twenty and four elders, no, they didn't need either. That's a wrong verse. I'll find you the right verse. I, it's one of those things where I just had one in mental. I, I, Joe Biden don't use what I do. It just kind of, foo. But it has to do with this. What They overcame him by that. The verse that I'm looking for is they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's, that's the verse that should have been written down. I don't know how I got Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Down. I'm glad you people are patient with me. <laughs> See, we don't walk or judge by outward appearance or circumstances. We believe and we walk by and we judge by what? What God has told us in His Word. What's He told us? This is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. Now, do you believe Him? What is it? Revelation 12, 11. Boy, I got close, didn't I? I did. It's half. Six is half of 12, so... Revelation 12, what was it again? 11. Revelation 12, 11 was the first I was trying to quote. Okay. And here's the next one. Take the, sh the helmet of salvation. Now think about it. Why don't we put a helmet on? Because you, you kill the head, I don't care how good your heart, lungs, liver, and every other organ is, you kill the head, what happens? And by him saying for us to take the shield of the helmet of salvation, it shows us again that what's involved in this thing of salvation? Our minds, our understanding. I always think about that. Come now, let us reason together. What's reasoning involved? Your mind, will, and understanding. This means that we who believe, we're to understand and view ourselves how? We're saved. We're justified. We're sanctified. And folks, we are, if we are in Christ, certain for final glory is if we're already there, always based on solely the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all our reasoning and all our imagination should be determined in light of that, of who and what we are. Do you know who you are? Do you know whom you believed? And are you persuaded, are you convinced that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And then for the first time, this next thing, he goes to an offensive weapon. All the rest of them are defensive. They're for our protection. And then he gives us a, an offensive weapon. And the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Again, what should be the believer's priority? His Word. In my shelf, in my office, i got a bookshelf. I've got a uh, filing cabinet in my office. I have every birthday card and anniversary card and birthday cards from my boys. And now late for the last seven or eight years, I have birthday cards from my, my granddaughter. I have cards in that shelf from when my son and daughter-in-law told me that I was going to be a grandfather. And I got a whole shelf. I've got them all. I started dating them because, I, you know, I mean, we're talking about, and you pull them out and you look at them and I think about how much these things mean. If you, had, if you were away at war and your, your husband sent you letters or they, you were away from one another because of work and they left you voice messages, what would you do? I don't listen. That's not important. No, you'd read it. Why? It's comforting. It relates to them what, what, what we have, what we possess, the, the love and fellowship that we enjoy one with another. This book tells us all that. This is God's love letter to His children. And we ought to avail ourselves of it. Because you think about it, Paul speaks of the Word of, the, of God itself here. He's talking about the law and the gospel and he, what does he compare it to? It's a sword. 
Paul told those in Hebrews, what kind of sword is it? He said it's a two-edged sword. It not only can kill, what else can it do? This sword can heal, right? It's able to discern the thought. This, this word, it shows the intent of our heart. This word shows why we're here today, and it does. And it's the light which in the hands of the Holy Spirit testifies to every true child of God that we're children of God, that we're born of God, and that everything that comes forth from us by way of works and obedience, where does it come from? It's wrought of God. You didn't do it on your own. And see, we use God's war word in our warfare against Satan as we preach and witness to the world concerning the gospel of salvation through Christ's obedience unto death as our only hope, ground, and cause of salvation. God's word is our final authority on everything. You hear it? But now look at how he sums this thing up, verse 18 through 20. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What's he asked them to do here for him and for one another? Huh? Pray for each other. Pray for me. And think about the way, the way he makes his statement. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly. In other words, the, the thought process of this is, is if you don't pray for me, what's going to happen? I'm not going to speak boldly. You say, well, hold on now. Now you're putting it back on me. Now let's think about this thing. God, Our God uses what? I, I, I know God's absolutely sovereign. And I know everything that's going to happen in this life is going to happen on purpose. Every bit of it. But I also know this. How does God accomplish his will? By means. The, the gospel is his means. Prayer is one of his means. I tell you what, every time, you go back and you read the Old Testament in particular, every time God was going to do something, you know what he did? He moved on the hearts of his people to pray, not their will, but whose will be done. So when our disciples asked him, said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught them, what did he tell them how to pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You think about it, prayer is one of the main means that God has given his children by which we grow in grace and knowledge of the truth. That we receive his blessings, spiritual blessings, and by which we withstand all the enemies of grace. And like I said just a moment ago, their prayers were the means that God used to deliver Paul and other ministers from the dangers of the enemies of God's grace. I mean, I... I swear it, it's it's hard, and and I know I've mentioned this so many times from this pulpit. True prayer is just it's tough. I, we don't know what to, I mean. I, I find myself thinking about that all the time. I I don't know what to pray for, and I don't know how to pray for it. Do you? Now I can throw up some words, but I'm talking about really pray, really submit my school. That's what you know what prayer true prayer is. It's it's an admission that I got control of nothing. That's what true prayer is. It's throwing myself at the feet of the God that has everything under control. We, we should pray, remember to pray for our brethren. And that's what he's calling on them to do here who, who minister the gospel. We sh you should pray for your pastor. Have you prayed for me this week? <laughs> I covet your prayers. I tell you, there's, there's, I, I hope and I trust that you occasionally, by God's grace, say, Lord, let that man not <laughs> lead him and guide him and direct him as he teaches us. Because I, I don't want to go astray on this thing, Kenny. I don't want to make any errors. 
I don't want to deceive anybody. I, yeah, and I certainly don't want to say anything that's contrary to God's revealed will by way of commandment. And I would that you would pray that the Lord would lead God and direct me to teach you and lead you and lead myself in the perfect way of righteousness. And we should always remember to pray for our brethren who are going through trials and tribulation and affliction, whether it's physical, mental, or spiritual. Pray one for another. Go read the epistle. And see, that's the thing. We have a tendency to take lightly the means of grace that God's given us. I know this much, the effectual fervent prayer of a, how did, think about it, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Hold on now. Wait, there's none righteous, no, not one. And how can I ever be a righteous man? Well, I've got to do right. No, 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 no. How we made righteous men? By imputation. See, that's the thing. We are, listen, he's told us he has made us kings and priests unto God. That's our present abiding position. And those priests in that Old Testament tabernacle, you know what they did? They prayed. And as kings and priests to God, we should follow their example. And do what? Pray one for another. Now again, God, God's sovereign. He's declared the end from the beginning. But I tell you what he's also declared. He's declared the means by which he'll accomplish his ends. Every one of them. God saves his elect, but he saves them how? Through the hearing and preaching and believing of the gospel. God delivers us, but he delivers us how? By prayer and by encouragements from what? Of his truth, his word. God comforts us, but he does it by a continual renewal of our minds. And this is so important. You've got to understand this too. Prayer, though it is an effective means that God has given us to use, it is not... <clears throat> It, it, prayer is not a modification of the will of God. In other words, you're not, you, you hear people all the time, I need y'all to bombard the throne of grace for my child or my wife or my job. It's as if somehow or another, if we stack enough up there, that he'll throw up his hand and, and okay, I'll change what I'm going to do and I'll do this. It, it don't change God's will. It's a glorification of God's will power. Folks, the saints are called to pray, and you know what true prayer is? It's an act of worship. True prayer. That's why I try to be careful when I pray. It's an act of worship. It, it's a, a bowing my will to his will. But then notice how he closes this epistle out. Look at verse 21 through 24. But that you also may know my affairs and how I do Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren in love from, with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all, be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sin. Seriously. <laughs> See, there's a difference between saying I love him and loving him in sincerity. Now, there he is. And here's the thing. I mean, when, I, when I think about the way Paul closes this argument, you can't help but go back to when he left him. He spent three years in Ephesus preaching the gospel there before he left. And when he finally determined to leave there, he called all of the elders together and told them that, you know, what he had done, how faithful he had been to preach the gospel. And it said when he told them that he's leaving, they all wept. And they didn't weep. They, the reason they wept is not so much that Paul was going away. They knew when he went away, you know what they said, that it's, that how it records it in the book of Acts. It said they, they wept over the fact they knew they'd see his face no more. And so he sends word to them by this man Tychicus to comfort them. Look, I'm okay. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And see, here's the thing. 
he's more concerned about them. This man's, this man's headed to Rome to, to stand before Caesar. He's been imprisoned. He's been shipwrecked. He's been in a, in a multitude of hard ways. And yet his concern is what? I want you comforted. I want you encouraged. And Paul closes by showing his love and concern for him. What does he do? He speaks peace to him. He pronounces the love of God upon him. The love of God is upon all those who believe the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity means that they realize that their only hope of eternal life is in the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness imputed, and that they're wholly dependent upon him, knowing that God is faithful to bring them to glory because Christ has met every single solitary condition of their salvation. And I'll close this book with this. This is that love of God that shed abroad in the hearts of every believer and this love of God that's shed abroad in the hearts of every believer, you know what it does? It brings out their love toward Christ. We love Him. Think about it. Why do I love Him? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. Think of it, holy and without blame before Him. We love Him, why? He chose me simply because He desired to chose me. It didn't have anything to do with me. It had everything to do with His sovereign will and purpose. And that's the love of God that brings out our love. We'll stop that. We'll come back and we'll pick up with a new book next week. You're dismissed to worship. Our